Is there any better time of the year than Sfall? Personalized gourd helmets, candy apples, jumping in leaves, it's the season that has it all, including an evil scientist that Perry can't even defeat by himself. Welcome back to Channel 626. I'm Mitchell, and this is a breakdown of all the details you might have missed in Phineas and Ferb Minor Monogram. The episode starts with the kids sitting in Phineas and Ferb's iconic tree, discussing everything great about Autumn. Then Phineas has an idea. Remember how we made Swinter? Let's make Sfall. I love how he says, Hey, where's Sperry? Then Buford blasphemously starts to cut down the tree before Isabella has to interject on behalf of all of us. Buford, you can't! That's Phineas's tree! That's the tree! Luckily enough, Ferb has created an invention that cranks out fall leaves to the tune of the Quirky Worky song. Now that's a leaf pile. As Phineas lays out the plans for their activity, we see that the leaf pile is 100 feet tall and composed of two types of leaves. Buford then expounds on his weird love of gourds by creating a unique gourd helmet for each of the kids. Exactly how does this capture my essence? Then we get a great needle drop as they jump into the pile of leaves. Welcome to Spa! trees are ready for shaking. Out of all the things Phineas and Ferb do over the summer, this might just be the one I'm most jealous about missing out on. Let's take a closer look at what they actually experience inside this pile. So they fall through four huge leaf piles before landing in a river of leaves, which leads to a serendipitous drop off. And at the bottom, they do a recreation of the famous painting of George Washington crossing the Delaware. Right before, they go over a leaf waterfall. Don't tell me. We're about to go over a huge waterfall. Yep. Sharp rocks at the bottom? Most likely. Bring it on. Meanwhile, Candace is explaining to Stacy on the phone that she's not going to waste any more time trying to bust the boys, but she can't even finish her sentence before she already breaks that promise. <gasps> Stacy, I gotta call you back. And on the wall behind her, we see portraits of Ferb, Perry, Phineas, what must be Linda, Candace, and Lawrence. Candace then digs through the leaf pile to try to find the boys, and eventually catches up to them as she flies down the leaf river and bumps into a tree. Good thing she had that gourd helmet from Buford, but her bubble bursts when she realizes... I can see that you're eating candy apples. Not something I can bust you for. That doesn't stop her from trying to bust them later anyway. And then Ferb says, Well, who's up for Sprummer? Which I really hope they do in one of the new episodes that they're making. While the kids are enjoying Sval, Perry is off on his own adventure. And down in his lair, we meet Major Monogram's son, Monty, for the very first time. Although Perry has already met him, apparently. And I guess Alka has a feeder school because Monty went to his waka. The high school without a cool acronym. After which we get another crucial piece of Major Monogram's backstory. My father was in the agency, and what you don't know is that he pressured me into following in his footsteps. But I always wanted to be an acrobat. Despite his dad's ambitions for him, though, Monty actually does want to fight evil. And in true Carl fashion, he volunteers to earn Major Monogram's affection. I'll become an acrobat if it'll make you proud of me. Meanwhile, Vanessa breaks up with her boyfriend, Johnny. We are so over, Johnny! Who's actually been in several previous episodes, including this very special scene. There's no platypus controlling me! Your dad's kinda cool. You're my punk rock boyfriend. You're not supposed to think my dad is cool. The breakup eventually clears the way for the budding relationship between Vanessa and Monty, but more on that later. And Doofenshmirtz then introduces us to a brand new character. So let me introduce Rodrigo to you. He's starting evil science school in the fall. Apparently there's not only a school for secret agents, but also one for evil scientists as well. And based on recent events, it's probably the University of Michigan. To be clear, the Big Ten said Michigan cheated. Anyway, Doofenshmirtz foreshadows Vanessa's eventual relationship with Monty when he says, You always go for the wrong type of guy. These bad boy types. And then he explains a crucial difference between him and Rodrigo. Hey, there's good evil and then there's bad evil. Which is actually kind of the theme of this episode. And this difference actually shows up later when Rodrigo usurps Doof, but more on that in a bit. Dr. Doofenshmirtz then launches into a lecture about how to be an evil scientist, which sets up a later episode where he has to do community service and ends up being a high school science teacher. And in a meta nod to his own reliance on the evil backstory trope, he emphasizes the importance of backstories as the emotional driver for antagonists. The backstory is what drives an evil scientist. It is the why does he do what he does of the what does he do. Perfectly not confusing. And he says, my point is, while holding and looking at a stick that doesn't actually have a point anymore. My point is. Then we get another meta nod to villainous tropes when he says, at its best, evil science is like undergoing deep Freudian analysis with a theremin constantly playing in the background. Referring to how many villains undergo psychological analyses during a show. The theremin is an electrical instrument often used for eerie situations, which you hear in the background of this scene theremin constantly playing in the background and is also commonly used in other shows like Loki. 
Perry then drops through the open roof where he gets trapped in a lookalike of Vanessa's boot. And Doof gets off this one-liner. Now that's what I call getting the boot. Getting the boot is a common phrase for getting fired or voted off a competition or something like that. Doofenshmirtz hilariously calls Vanessa's style Vampire Pilgrim Scuba Diver. And you can definitely see elements of all of those in her wardrobe. And Doofenshmirtz provides some apt analysis for us. Who will win? Good or evil? No one can say. Except, of course, if you go by recent statistics, which it's pretty much good who wins every single time, no matter what. A self-aware man, I like that. Perry is not enthused as Doofenshmirtz accidentally explains democracy. Every single person would be in charge and we'd be forced to, I don't know, decide the rules together by voting or something. And when he tries to warn Doof that Rodrigo's gonna take them both down, we learn this secret about their communication between each other. Wait, you can understand him? Oh, heck no. I, I usually just pretend he's talking about recent movies I've seen. And apparently Doofenshmirtz hid his towers in a falafel cart and a hidden rising tower warehouse incorporated building. Which is funny because he said he put them in precise locations. I have installed in two precise locations. But a falafel cart by definition is mobile and could hypothetically be anywhere in the world at that point. This is where we see the good evil versus bad evil come into play as Rodrigo enumerates his plan to destroy the tri-state area and take over the world. He then pulls a Darth Vader. Join me, Vanessa, and together we will take over the world. Join me, and together we can rule the galaxy. And Vanessa pulls a Luke. Join you? I don't work for him. That's my father, you dweeb. It is the only way. Good for her. Either Vanessa can understand what Perry's saying, but Doofenshmirtz can't, or she's doing the same thing and just pretending she knows what he's saying. Yeah, I know. What a dip, right? Luckily for Perry, Monty sees his distress signal, even though Major Monogram and Carl ignore it, choosing acrobatics instead. And he drops in just in the nick of time to save the day. I love how he combines his spy training and acrobatics training to defeat the enemy, all while his dad watches on in admiration. Vanessa then comes in clutch with another hint of her affinity for good guys as she frees Perry from his trap, only for him to go and tie up her dad. Then Monty jumps off the building and flies away using wings that are very similar to the ones that Perry used in the preceding episode. And we get a hint of a future relationship between Vanessa and Monty. I think it's time I try to... A good guy. Much to Perry's surprise. Oh, and we learn that the kid's leaf pile disappears before their mom can see it because of Doofenshmirtz's failed plan. Although this time he never referred to his invention as an innator. And that's everything I caught in this one. Let me know in the comments, which one do you prefer, Swinter or Sfall? And if you ship Monty and Vanessa, make sure to check out my Drusselstein Ween breakdown where we dive more into that relationship. You guys absolutely rock. I'm so grateful for your support as we build this community of shared fandom. For all who celebrate, have a great Thanksgiving and enjoy this autumn season. But most of all, remember, there's no pad place controlling me. There's no pad place controlling me. No, it counts. It doesn't matter.